Well, welcome everyone. This is going to be, I think, a very exciting uh, webinar on podcasting. Almost all of my clients think that they need a podcast or they'd like to do it. And it seems so simple, but I suspect there's way more to it. And then uh, you have to market it pretty much. So we're going to find out about podcasting to market yourself, how to start and grow your show. We have Vikram Rajan with us today from Manhattan, a New Yorker, but we're going to be able to understand him even if we're not from New York. I have a couple of slides that I need to get through before we turn it over to him. So uh, I'm Diane McKeever. I am the education chair at the Minnesota chapter of SCORE. SCORE, the organization that's bringing you this free webinar, is a nation nationwide nonprofit organization made up of over 300 chapters nationwide. <clears throat> As I said, ours is the Minnesota chapter, and we serve Manatee and Sarasota counties. And our chapter has about 90 volunteers who are ready to help mentor you with your business challenges. We do this for free. I have about 30 clients that I'm working with now, and, and I'll work with them on a weekly, monthly, bi-annual basis. Sometimes, you know, we get started and we work intently on projects that they have, and then it peters off a little bit. But if you're thinking that you might need some business help, look at SCORE. Uh, our chapter was recently named a District Chapter of the Year. So... It, where in the business cycle can we help you? Well, literally the entire process. You're thinking about a business. You haven't rented any place. That's a great time. Thank you. That would be a great time to talk to us. And we could advise you as to whether or not that really is the way to go. Or you're in a startup phase and you're open and now you need some help or you want to grow your business. Or lastly, you want to sell or close your business. Or maybe conversely, you want to buy a business. We have mentors that special just in that. And if you contact us, you will be assigned one of them. So how do you find out about these mentors? Well, you go to our website, which is score.org slash Minnesota, or you could just go to score.org. There's a big old button that says request a mentor. You click on it, put in a little bit of information about you and your business, and you will be assigned a mentor within the next day or two. It's a really fast process and we can help you get you going. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors and community partners. Without these guys, uh, we wouldn't be in business. We wouldn't be able to bring you these resources. You'll note that many of our sponsors are banks. If you're looking for financing, they listen to you a lot better, a lot more carefully if you come in with a SCORE mentor because they know that you've been through the process. They know that you have a business plan. They know that you've thought through some of your challenges. So consider... Uh, getting a mentor if it's only to help you get funding for your business. So looks like uh, I'm at my last slide. Vikram is ready to share his information with you. Just a reminder, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, let's leave the chat for just chatting. Uh, I'll often uh, put information in there to share with you. Uh, but other than that, uh, let's get started. You will also be getting a copy of the slides. So let me stop sharing. Okay. Well, so you should be able to um, see uh, my screen, right? So you, me, uh, uh, we can. You're not really in the slideshow. Uh, yep, yep. I'm, I'm going to be. Okay. I'm going to be. So I'm going to be. So here now. Right. Oh, look at that. Masterful. Okay. Masterful. Now, do you see any of the Zoom overlay on? I do not. You may okay, you may put all kinds of things on your well, screen if you'd like. I'm sort of keeping tabs on, on the QA. Definitely as for all the participants. Um, as you think of a question, before you forget it, put it into the QA. Um, this way, Diane can either interrupt me um, and, and see if I'll answer it right then and there if it's in the um, context. And if it's not in context, I'll say, you know, I'll, I'll get to it later or hopefully we'll have time at the end and I'll just kind of run through some of the questions that uh, had no context for. But definitely flood the uh, Q&A with your questions. Um, I've presented this many, many times for SCORE uh, up here in New York. 
So thank you, Diane, for inviting me to be part of uh, your SCORE chapter. And uh, everything I'm going to share with you, um, Diane, as well as the participants, um, this is stuff that I talk about all day long. Uh, we run, um, I don't know if, if there's even a slide for it. Yeah, this is some of my podcasts. It's changed titles over uh, the years. And this really came out of me having um, not only my own podcast, but right now we're up to about 25 different video interview podcasts. So everything uh, I'm going to show you and teach you and that you can even do on your own, we do actively for clients. So um, it, it happened through trial and error uh, and um, more errors than, than anything else. And I remember four or five years ago when I started my podcast, uh, I was like, how hard can it be? Much like I, you were saying, Diane, um, and, and but knowing that it was a lot. And about four or five episodes in, I got very overwhelmed with not the difficulty, but just the time consuming nature of it all. There's a lot of moving parts that you have to do consistently, episode after episode. And that became really tiring and distracting. And so I turned to Stacy, who's on my staff. She's a longtime friend uh, from college and kind of our right hand person at the company. I said, Can you do all this so I can just show up at showtime? And she's like, yeah, sure, but what do I need to do? And that's what I kind of basically distilled into a series of checklists that I'll show you at the end as well that you can also get uh, uh, get individually. So you should be able to get this as a recording. So if I you know, talk uh, you know, New York fast, you can pause the recording and kind of understand what I'm saying, take notes. I believe you can also get these slides uh, through your score mentor or through Diane. Uh, so feel free to get that. Uh, and actually make use of it. I'm going to go through two parts today, where the first part is going to be talking much more about kind of the structure, the strategy of how and why we're going to be doing a podcast. And then the second half is going to be much more on the technology of actually doing it. So kind of two halves to kind of prepare you of like, what are we going to get into, like which microphone or which camera? Uh, I'll, I'll address those kinds of concerns in the second half. First, I want to kind of go into uh, what should you do with your podcast and how should you format it and, and, and kind of think of the business model around your podcast. So let's kind of jump right in. By the way, Diane, um, how much time do I have? It's, it's just after 12, about 12.10. Right. So this I'm, is scheduled for 45 minutes, so it would be about 12.45. And then yeah. we have an extra 15 minutes assigned, so you cool. can take as much of that as you need. About 45 minutes or so off starting now. So great. So I want you to first think about a traditional podcast. Most people, when they think of a podcast, you know, Apple, of course, started it with their iPods and they wanted to create kind of a, a broadcast for their iPod, right? That's where the podcast word came from. And traditionally, though, it was audio. Um, and, and the benefits of having an audio podcast is that you can literally, if not figuratively, phone it in and it could just be you and your guest or it could be you talking. We'll talk about that. And because it's not necessarily visual traditionally, uh, you could do it from anywhere. Um, anywhere you have your cell phone, you could have bed hair, be in your PJs, have a messy desk. And those are the benefits of having an audio only podcast. Um, however, the world of podcasts are very quickly moving to the world of video. And I will share with you a little bit of, of my bias of why I like video podcasts. Uh, there are going to be statistics that I'll share with you, but I'm not going to you know, bore you with the statistics, you already kind of know that pod podcasts are pretty popular and that it's a, it's a, a relatively um, mainstream uh, me media at this point. And the world of podcasts have very much become video podcasts. YouTube right now uh, is moving towards uh, having more of a podcast presence. Um, now there is a podcast tab available in your YouTube channel, so you can literally delineate an area for your uh, podcast. You can have a podcast as a playlist. I'm just going to mute my phone so I don't keep bothering us. Um, plus, Spotify, which is uh, overtaken Apple Podcasts as the number one podcast app platform, um, about two years ago started their um, video aspect of video podcasts. Um so right now in the world of video podcasts, you basically have YouTube and Spotify battling it out. Uh, Google Podcasts is actually folding in January, and they're literally folding it into YouTube Music for YouTube to be Google's 
platform for podcasts. Uh, why do you want uh, to be on YouTube, well, from a search engine optimization and people finding your podcast, uh, Google owns YouTube, I'm sure you know. So if people are Googling your name or Googling topics, uh, you want your podcast to rank well. And of course, if it's on YouTube, it'll rank better on Google. Social media uh, prioritizes uh, video uh, over even just regular links. And so you're able to now use um, either the whole episode and have it as a YouTube share on either LinkedIn or Facebook, et cetera, but then you could also use YouTube Shorts and you could do clips and reels and be part of the world of social media, short form video or long form. So either way, uh, the world of social media is very video centric. Uh, I also like uh, the, the world of video podcasts because you're able to uh, really have eye contact with the people that you are addressing very similar where I have to stare at the black hole of the camera to kind of make eye contact with you guys. Um, I, I really hope that that you're able to get to know me that way and that no like and trust factor from a marketing standpoint can be better established with body language and visual eye contact that you can get, of course, with video that you don't get just audio only. The body language doesn't necessarily trans translate as well. Of course, you have the tone and vocal aspects of audio. But that's why I like video. You get that, you know, body language. And nowadays, uh, it's relatively simple. Let's give me a quick second. Uh, sorry, it's just gonna ignore that. My mother-in-law calling. Uh, right nowadays, it's relatively easy to do video podcasts with Zoom or a different platform called StreamYard. So StreamYard, you may not have heard of. Um, StreamYard. There are a couple of other platforms that are similar to StreamYard which are purposely built for these types of interview shows. StreamYard is meant much more for live streaming, though you don't have to do live streaming with it. You can have it recorded, make sure everything came out well, and then publish it. But the reason I like StreamYard for our kind of clients is that we're able to do the full editing of the show in real time during the recording and not have to do much editing after. The only time we have to do any editing for our clients is if they inadvertently say something that they shouldn't have said, uh, and those kind of, or flubbed up someone's name or something of that sort, then we have to edit. But the intro of Welcome to the XYZ Show with your host XYZ, that can be played in real time. The outro, as it's known, can also be there. Uh, you can cut to a commercial break. You can have um, a full graphics around, which Zoom doesn't really enable us to have, like lower thirds or, or a streaming, like a scrolling bar. Um, we could do screen share, B-roll, we can have um, uh, different backgrounds, much like what we can do with Zoom. StreamYard is, think of it as easy to use as Zoom, where you can click a link and jo be joined together in a virtual studio, much like me and Diane are, uh, but it's purpose-built for a video interview type podcast. Um, there's uh, other platforms like Restream, there's Riverside.fm, there are about two or three that are really popular uh, in the podcast world. We happen to use StreamYard. I'm not paid by them at all. It's just I'm comfortable with it. Uh, but if you use any other similar platform, uh, they all kind of work similarly. Um, so these are some of the statistics that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, going through. Uh, the the I irony of these statistics is that uh, A, it's outdated You know, as soon as people publish it, and B, it's, the trend is way more important than the actual snapshot statistic. And the trend of knowing that podcasts are becoming popular on, on social media and that the hosts themselves are being able to be branded and be celebrities unto themselves is only growing stronger. And kind of knowing that YouTube and Spotify are battling it out and, and sometimes um, Spotify is, is more popular than YouTube. And some people don't even realize that you know Spotify has podcasts. I've heard that before. Uh, but it is more popular than Apple Podcasts. And YouTube is sometimes more popular than Spotify. Sometimes people are watching interview shows on YouTube, not even realizing that it is a podcast. Kind of doesn't matter. I'll kind of mention that uh, here in this next uh, slide, that there's basically two main formats of podcasts. In the world of presentation podcasts, I call them, for lack of a better word, presentation is it's, it's a solo type podcast. It might be two people or three people talking, but they're not having any guests, which is really the interview style that I'll talk about. Um, this type of podcast is very similar to a long form webinar or a long form blog. 
and it's basically you presenting information. Um, it kind of doesn't matter if you call it a podcast or a webinar, seminar, a blog, a video blog, a video podcast. It's all the same kind of stuff. Um, with all due respect and deference to Italian cuisine, I use the analogy of pasta and say, look, at the end of the day, it's all kind of the same semolina flour dough. And whether you extrude it as spaghetti or linguine or you extrude it into long sheets for lasagna or routine, rotini in the spiral type pasta, well, the shape matters maybe for the dish because you kind of don't want to use spaghetti in a, in, in a lasagna dish. Um, but at the same time, it's all the same stuff. And so the actual uh, content, which is like the dough, the you know, semolina uh, durum uh, flour of, of pasta, well, the content is going to be good, right, regardless. But the shape of it, be it a blog or a podcast or what have you, is really more because of how you're looking to have it look and present. So hopefully that analogy makes sense a little bit. So I don't really care if someone's watching a YouTube video and don't realize that it's a podcast or they're watching a podcast and don't realize that, you know, they're watching it on my website and they could just as easily be watching it on, on YouTube or they could be listening to it like on their commute in their car or up here where we take subways a lot here in New York City and you can, you can listen to it. So if they have the video version of the podcast, well, now I have the audio version for Spotify and Apple, et cetera. I can then take the audio version and transcribe it. And we do that with our clients where speaker labeled transcription is relatively easy to get done. And now you have essentially a blog post for your website, which would be great for your search engine optimization, your SEO purposes. So the benefit of having kind of your own platform as a presentation is that, well, you get to control it all. So you can basically do it on your flexible schedule. It could be your topics. Uh, you could make it as short or as long. Every episode can be different. You kind of control everything. Now, I tend to like the concept of an interview show for a couple of reasons. One, I think it's a lot more interesting to, especially in a longer form format, to watch two people discussing a topic and having two voices and hearing that is a lot more interesting than just one person. You know, this is a 45 minute seminar. I have a, a good amount of slides, a good amount of preparation that I did for this, but there was a lot of heavy lifting here. And for me to do that on a week to week basis with a different topic each week, every episode, that's a, that's a big burden. Now for me to have a guest and kind of share the burden, if you will, and have a conversation and good banter where it's still substantive, but it doesn't have, uh, have me required for a whole presentation on my own makes it a lot easier. Also, you're basically having an appointment with someone else, which means from an accountability standpoint, you're more apt to actually get it done. I don't know about you, but for me, um, it's very easy for me to bump uh, something that I only have an appointment with myself and well, some, something else can happen that's more urgent or more important. And maybe I can do it tomorrow and tomorrow never comes or I do it next week. And then I lose the habit of having my consistent podcast Versus if I have an appointment with someone else, it's going to get done. Last but not least is a cross-promotion opportunity. What I really love about having an interview-oriented show and why I would suggest for you to have a, a guest-oriented show is that think of a Venn diagram, the two overlapping intersecting circles. Well, not only are you sharing your podcast with your circle of influence, your guest is excited not only to come onto your podcast and share his or her insight, but they're equally excited to share the episode to their circle of influence, their Instagram, their Facebook, their LinkedIn, their email, their website. And so their circle of influence is going to get to know not only that episode, but get to know the other episodes as well. You're able to pull people from their circle of influence into yours. And that's the number one way podcasts grow uh, outside of advertising and search and discovery. And I'll, I'll get to the, the ways in a moment. But I want you to, especially from a business building standpoint, if you're creating a podcast that's looking to support your business, well, you want to basically pull potential clients and customers and fans from your guest circles of influence. And think about it every week, your guest is connected to a couple of hundred people, maybe a couple of thousand, maybe they're very influential and it's tens of thousands of people. So every week is a different guest. Every week, your, your guest is basically sharing it to their circle of influence and you're pulling people from their circle into yours. That's extremely powerful. That word of mouth pull that your guests have with their circle of influence about your podcast 
is going to be tremendous. And that snowball uh, happens episode after episode. So let's actually start talking about once you kind of think about, all right, maybe I'll do an interview show more than a uh, solo podcast. How are we going to make money off of this? Well, there are about seven different ways that you'll see of different podcasts monetize how they uh, monetize their show. This is a handy diagram that we'll kind of walk, I'll walk you through. You can kind of think about um, four main ways that you can imagine podcasts are making money. You have the advertising stream, you have the affiliates, which I'll talk about in a little bit. You, what is account-based monetization and then the PPL, I'll see it to the end. And you'll kind of see that there's different types of advertising models, different types of affiliate models, different types of account models. And that's based on, is it more focused on that Y-axis of audience, that vertical Y-axis, versus the horizontal axis of guests. And I'm going to go step by step, uh, monetization by monetization. Let's get started. Most people think about advertising to the audience. And that's kind of the typical way that people think about the very top podcasts, maybe the ones you listen to that have sponsors and ads. How are they making money? Well, they're making money through ads, a very traditional media platform, right? where the way YouTube makes money, the way NBC makes money, the way any kind of cable show makes money is usually through advertising. There are other me methods for them in terms of licensing, but most people think of, they get a big audience and I'm gonna monetize that big audience. Um, the benefit, of course, is that immediate cash flow. You're getting paid by the advertiser. Everyone loves that. But if you think about it from their perspective, the advertiser's perspective, um, they wanna know what's in it for them. They want to know that they got an ROI, a return on investment. And of course, it's very risky to them. They got to know that they're going to get that ROI and you're basically having to give them some type of evidence that they will. And so you need to show metrics of engagement, meaning not only the size of the audience, but how engaged are they? How participatory are they? Are they actually interactive? Have they bought other things? Have they filled out other surveys and forms? Are they interactive? Are they an engaged community? So one way or another, if you're able to prove conversions that your audience have converted into sales, that's the ideal way. Now, ultimately, courting advertisers boils down to who you know. It's the relationships. Now, yeah, you can cold call and cold email and look for advertisers and sponsors, but they're going to be that much more skeptical and the relationship needs to be built. If you already have relationships, like, for example, SCORE has relationships with these banks and other types of uh, resources for entrepreneurs, well, they already know uh, sports repu good reputation and they're willing to thus sponsor their seminar series, case in point. Same thing is going to operate for you and your podcast. Build the relationships even now when you don't have the metrics and you don't have the proof. You're not hitting them up for money right now. You're developing the relationship with people. And ultimately, it's people doing business with people. And as you develop that relationship and involve them in, in the creation of your podcast, when you get to the point where you have the metrics to show, they'll be more than happy to sponsor your podcast because quite frankly for them, it has to be a business decision based on ROI. Uh, now, there can be an angel aspect. There can be a, a place where they believe in who you are. They believe in what you're doing, the message, the, the mission of not only your business, but of the podcast. And that can be seen as a patron, you know, a patron of the arts, if you will. And so there are platforms nowadays where you can basically get donations from your fans and even sponsors where people are kind of giving you a couple of dollars here and there, kind of a tip jar aspect, and that can add up over time. And you may have heard of some of these platforms. So there's one platform called Patreon. Think of the word Patreon with an E in the middle, right? Patreon. And YouTube um, creators as well as podcast hosts rely on Patreon as angel donations. Now, they may incentivize the angel donations from their fans by creating exclusive content or creating merchandise and swag that's related to the podcast. So you can monetize that way. But for the most part, people are donating because they believe in you. And maybe they also want access to you privately or they want access to premium content, private content, or some of the merch that you're creating around your podcast. Now, typically, merch for a, for a podcast is reserved more for the entertainment-oriented podcasts. Today, we're really talking about the business-building-oriented podcasts. Now, there are some businesses that are, are enabled to sell a, a lot of merch and logo information. You know, there are some um, um, businesses that have such a, a, a fanatic community where people will uh, have a tattoo of their of that logo, of like a Harley logo on 
on their arm, you may not quite have that type of fan base right now where people are willing to have a tattoo of your logo on uh, their arm, uh, but maybe one day you will. Uh, in that course, you can create merch for your podcast, but that's the world of patrons in general. So we're not going to go into a lot of detail. There are uh, six other ways that you can monetize that we'll get into. Just so that you understand some of the terminology, what's a sponsor versus an advertiser. Typically an advertiser, um, either you're reading the ad or you're showing their ad or playing the ad is pre-recorded. Um, and it's kind of a straight advertising perspective. Think of a sponsor being part of a larger package. It's a bundle. So not only are they an advertiser, but maybe they're also getting ads and banners on the website. Maybe you're doing a specific, a specific interview with them and you're dedicating an episode to what they do as a business. And so as a sponsor, think of it as kind of an advertiser package where there are a lot of different moving pieces um, to it. And usually it's tailored to what they're looking for. Ultimately, it boils down to an ROI though, it, as opposed to just a, a donation patron. The second way of monetizing is affiliates. Now there's, that's a kind of a technical term in the world of internet marketing. Affiliate is basically a profit or revenue sharing partner. Basically, where you say, I will promote your product, you don't have to pay me anything up front, but when someone buys your product because of me, because they're entering in that special code that I'm going to say during my show, you're going to give me anywhere from 10%, maybe 50%, depending on the product price or the type of product it is. If it's a hard good where there's a lot of uh, manufacturing expense and marketing expense, it's usually around the 10 to 20%. If it's a digital type product or a course, or, or a book or something of that sort where there's a high profit margin, it could be upwards of 50%. And that's just the range. And that there is no hard and fast number. It's really, again, what you can negotiate as, um, as a podcast host. Now, you could probably command a larger percentage if you have that much more of an influence over a large audience. But quite frankly, there's very little risk to the advertiser, right? They're not shelling out any money up front. You're basically saying when someone buys something because of my influence, you're going to share that revenue with me. It's a great stepping stone. It can even be more lucrative than straight advertising. Plenty of the larger podcasts buy more on affiliates, more than even straight advertising, because they know the influence they have over their audience, their community, their fan base. It also enables you to start proving the conversions. So you can start seeing that, all right, I've got 100 listeners 20 of them bought, that's tremendous. I've got 1,000 listeners, 50 of them bought. Not great engagement, but it's more than 20. And so you can start showing the metrics of engagement that way. So affiliate links become a tremendous stepping stone. It's a lot easier to acquire. It's relatively easy for you to negotiate because uh, there's no risk really for the uh, um, very little risk, I should say. Their risk is, of course, associating with you, your podcast, your reputation, and of course, you know, advertisers are, are constantly assessing the risk when they partner with uh, anyone else. Now, I suggest very similar to an affiliate, like a commission-based sales is another way of thinking of an affiliate, that you start with your own commission-based sales, that you are self-advertising. You should be your first advertiser. You should prove conversion because your podcast is helping you build your business. Uh, a lot of my clients are, are, are attorneys, and so... For me, I'm always looking at it where in the course of 12 episodes, which we call a season, those are all made up phrases. Um, there is no necessary number of episodes per season. I started with 10 and then realized uh, there's a reason why ancient cultures have base 12 in their numeric and clock time-based system. Like a lot easier to divide things by 12. And so we have 12 episodes for a season. Feel free to adopt that. Today, someone was about to do a 15-episode season. I was almost going to say that um, this podcast will start on Tuesday. Um, and I said, you know what? Let me just go stick with 12 because I know 15 is just going to bother my whole staff. Um, so I said, no, let's just do 12. Um, so I gave up a couple of episodes because of that um, just to kind of have standardization. Um, and so a 12-episode season, um, typically my clients are doing a weekly episode so they can mathematically think of it as literally a season, right, three months. Um, as much as the math would work, ideally, um, inevitably you will have what my clients end up where they have to skip a couple of weeks here and there because they're on vacation, they're sick, their guest has to reschedule, stuff will happen. So a, a three-month, 12-episode season will end up being more like four or five months. Um, 
but nonetheless, maintain the weekly episode if you can, because that develops a lot of momentum. Uh, if you do an episode every other week, of course, it's half the amount, right? So it takes you twice as long to build the same amount of momentum. What do I mean by momentum? Well, audience growth, your own comfortability as being a talk show host um, and knowing what you're doing. And so you're, it's going to take you twice as long if you do it every other week as opposed to weekly. Shy away from monthly. Monthly is just like every time you do it, you know, every time it's going to be like the first time. And it's, it's way too long. If you, if you can only do monthly, something is better than nothing, so okay. Um, but I would highly recommend if you're able to carve out a half an hour, 45 minute once a week, uh, that'll be tremendous. And that'll really help build the business because every week is that Venn diagram pulling new people into your circle of influence, into your funnel, into your business. And so I'll talk a little bit more about uh, capturing that interest a little bit later, but this is the place to start. Depends on how high ticket your, your products and services are. But if you're able to advertise literally during your podcast where you take a commercial break, send them to a landing page, capture their email address, send them to some type of a bundled package, make it a relatively easy sale. It doesn't have to be low cost, but relatively easy where there's not a lot of moving pieces. This is what they can buy right now. And then, of course, you can always customize later. So make it simple for your customers to buy because of your podcast. And of course, it should be relevant to the episode. Now, there are a whole other aspect to uh, monetization. What we talked about is very audience-oriented of really monetizing the audience, but you can also monetize the guests. I'm not a huge fan. There's a typo here. It should be pay to play. Um, every time I present this, I, I notice a typo and I forget to edit it. So there's a pay to play model, which I'm not a huge fan of, but it is a legitimate model, basically charging your guests to come onto your podcast. I'm not a huge fan of it personally. Um, I also don't like participating in it. It's like, if I'm going to pay to be on your podcast, well, then I'm an advertiser, which I don't necessarily mind, but I'd rather be a sponsor and get all their stuff out of it and create something that's a little bit more um, uh, beneficial mutually and create an affiliate link and things of that nature. Um, so there's a pay-to-play model, however, and it's very similar to you having an advertising-based model. You are, in a way, um, still kind of beholden to the audience because your guest wants to know, very similar to a straight advertiser, uh, what's in it for me? You know, what's the ROI? How large is your audience? What's the engagement like? Can you show me conversions? And then it really does depend then on how much they are paying to be on your show. Maybe they are part of a larger package, and that's a monetization that you could do. Now, there's the affiliate links that you're doing, right, for yourself or from others, but think about guests providing an affiliate link to you. Now, naturally, they're going to be providing insights and knowledge that's going to be very educational and substantive for your audience to learn from, but also, inevitably, what they do for a living, their business, their products will come up, uh, and you want to give them that platform. Now, is there an opportunity for you to also make money off of that? That's very commonplace, where very often you'll probably provide some type of a discount code, and that discount code for your audience is also going to give you a percentage as well. Now, I would suggest to, to, um, to declare that and, and make sure that your audience knows. You shouldn't really do anything that they, your audience doesn't know about, but uh, I'm always happy to support a podcast host that I'm a fan of. And for me to know that they're going to make 10, 20%, you don't have to disclose the percent, but say, hey, by the way, when you buy this, not only do you get a discount, but um, I'll also be compensated to keep this podcast alive and successful for you. And you spin it that way, which is true, right? Because you are looking to get paid so that you can have a successful podcast to keep it continue. Because quite frankly, if you can't make money off your podcast, either through the business or through the podcast itself, Sooner or later, you're going to have to use your time in other ways. And so for your audience to know that you'll also benefit when they buy the product and that they also get a discount, it's a win-win in all around. The proof of conversion is evident, right? Because they're putting in that code to get a discount. You're going to get that percentage. You're able to then show other types of affiliates or other types of advertisers that, look, my audience is not only engaged, they're happy to listen, but they also buy the products and services that I recommend. Now, you have to really tread carefully. You can ask your guests, hey, by the way, do you provide an affiliate link when you come on other people's podcasts? That's the question I ask. Um, this way, if the answer is no, well, not really, what's an affiliate link? Well, I can explain it to them and you know, see, like, see if they're into it. If they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I always provide affiliate links. Great. 
Now the answer is yes for you as well. And so that's the easiest question. Hey, do you provide an affiliate link when you go on other people's podcasts? The presumption is a, they do go on other people's podcasts and that they already know what an affiliate link is. They already have it set up. And those are the easiest. If they don't, if they're not into it and you're going to skip it, it's uh, it's a third, it's the fifth of seven uh, monetization. Can you architect a podcast to do all seven? You can. I haven't. Uh, but you could probably focus on two or three of these monetization models and really make it uh, great. Very similar to how I say start you as the advertiser where your podcast is helping you get clients for your business. That's the place to start. Very similarly, I say start here. So there are kind of two starts. One in terms of you being the advertiser, and then number two, your guest being a referral relationship. Very much in line with that Venn diagram perspective. Now, PERM is an internal acronym. It's an acronym I made up. It's called Post Episode Review Meeting. I find it critical. If your guest is in a position to refer clients to you, well, uh, that behooves you to set up a follow-up time of a post episode review meeting for you to kind of check in with them maybe two weeks after the episode comes out, and you're basically looking to see how did they share the episode to their circle of influence? How was the episode for them? Did they get a did they get any inquiry from your circle of influence to them? And then is there a way for you to do other types of cross marketing? Focus on their call to action, their CTA, meaning how do they get people interested on their website? Do they have a landing page, an email capture page, a freebie, a lead magnet? Focus on what they're doing to attract people into their business. Maybe they are, they're not that sophisticated yet, but it's an opportunity for them, you know, to kind of understand why you're going to then be sharing your call to action. So you should have that kind of a landing page, an email capture page, provide some type of a freebie or a lead magnet as it's known. And it's that kind of thing that you're going to be talking about on your podcast and really make this a good pull. Because you really want to pull people from their circle of influence into your lead magnet. That's the easiest way to start pulling. There are other ways that I could discuss offline, but that's the simplest way. Now, there may be even an opportunity as you do your post-episode review meeting that the guests themselves, when they see your call to action, they see your freebie, they're like, you know what? I could actually use your help. And you may be in a position to help your guest as your guest being a client or a customer. Now, unless they identify themselves, I don't like pitching my guests because, you know, that's just you know, kind of in poor taste. But I want to whet their appetite if they want to identify themselves as someone who potentially needs my products and services. Well, then I definitely don't want to do them a disservice. I definitely want to then be able to help them. There may actually be an opportunity for you to even brainstorm names of people that you can refer to them and then brainstorming names of people that they can refer to you. All that happens because of the podcast episode. So focus on having that podcast episode being really strong and substantive and educational for your audience through your guests, and then you have the post-episode review meeting. The seventh area that I'll talk about very quickly is really turning your podcast itself into private content. Uh, I have clients right now that are in the midst of where they know that they're going to do a series of episodes and turn their episode into a book, either a video book, which I like more, or turn it into a physical text book. Um, and that concept is really having a podcast product. You can also turn a few episodes into private premium content for a Patreon, et cetera. You can couple it and create a couple of episodes and create a course around that. I have another client that's creating a course um, and she also runs a podcast. And one of the things that we're talking about is how some of her episodes can be part of that course. Um, and so you're basically turning your podcast itself into a product that people pay for which is great because now you're having a direct ROI. You're basically there. People are paying to listen to your podcast. And that's the kind of, some people have a private podcast where you can only listen to it. If you pay as a subscription, other people are using this as kind of a, a beginning funnel where a couple of episodes are premium and private. So it's another way of monetizing and thinking of like, all right, I'm creating these episodes. Maybe it's public for the first month. And then I remove it and it's no longer public. And in order to access it, you have to be part of my subscription base, either through a Patreon or some other type of subscription base, because you know how valuable the content is and say, look, you can listen to it for free for the first 30 days, but then it goes part of the private community. And now you're productizing your podcast. So hopefully this goes, uh, helps you kind of think of all the different ways you can start thinking of, of a podcast business model. I'm going to stop here, Diane. Are there any questions that I should answer? 
Yes, uh, there are a couple of, uh, I think, simple questions that you could answer. Uh, you mentioned speaker transcription. How do you create the transcription? So we, we, I have my own in-house software that we built that plugs into Amazon's um, uh, speech recognition software. Um, but there are public ones. So you can use Rev, R-E-V. So Rev is a, is a good one. Descript is also a very popular one in the world of podcasts. Uh, they do transcription and captions and clips and descriptive, like a whole podcast um, platform where you can do a variety of things with Descript, like a description but just with a T at the end, Descript or Rev. Uh, we use both. Um, I don't use Descript as much. Uh, we will probably do more because as we're looking at clips and AI and, and stuff like that, Descript does AI-oriented clips and there are other platforms for AI clips that I can talk about later. Um, or we use Rev a lot. We use Rev um, whenever I, for some reason, either because there's some glitch with our software, um, but we have other services that we, that we use Rev uh, uh, transcription for internally is my own software, but it works similarly to all these other platforms. Uh, I've been advised to, oh, I'm sorry. Ready, yeah, go on, Dan. ready for another question. I've been advised to keep my podcast brief, i.e. 30 to 40 minutes, which I try to follow. What are your guidelines? Yeah, I like a 30 minute podcast, especially from a business building podcast. Um, you'll see the, large, the, the more popular entertainment oriented podcast being longer, uh, that usually they're like at least an hour, if not two, three hours. And they're kind of from like the drive time radio aspect. It's kind of like Howard Stern's model uh, of advertising. And then he went to Sirius XM. You can kind of imagine Joe Rogan following in his footsteps of kind of being controversial, et cetera. And, but whatever you think about them it is not, it's kind of beside the point outside of the business model that they have. And so they'll have a two to three hour type podcast, mainly for advertising purposes only. Outside of that, um, there's really like really no reason to have something that long. I think it's ridiculous to do. That's their profession. They make millions of dollars and, you know, good for them. For a business building podcast, I highly recommend doing it half an hour for a couple of reasons. Half an hour is something that is doable for you to keep up with. So on a consistent basis, once a week, say half an hour, it's doable. Um, and, and so, okay, now you can carve it into your schedule. Half an hour probably means more like 45 minutes because you got to get there a little bit early. Your guest might be a little late. 30, might, 30 minute conversation may end up really being 35 minutes, but 45 minutes is still doable. You know it's going to be definitely done within the hour and gives you a time for a potty break and go to the next meeting. Half an hour is also a good amount of time for your guests. They can carve it out in their schedule. They can literally show up at showtime and leave, and you know you can get guests to talk to you for about a half an hour, especially that this is not their main business, right? If you're attracting guests that are keynote speakers and they have books and they've got their own podcast, well, they've got a whole media thing going. They could probably do longer. But if you're going to be interviewing folks who are client or customer resources and referral relationships, they may not do a lot of podcasts. They may not do a lot of blogs, et cetera. For them, a half an hour is doable. Um, it's also a good amount of time where you can be substantive enough that you do want this to be educational and not just a commercial pitch for you or for your guests. But it's enough where it's substantive enough, but you want them coming back for more. From a marketing standpoint, I always say, look, I want my fans and the audience to have more questions at the end than that they even had in the beginning. Maybe even case in point for this webinar, you'll end up having more questions at the end than you even thought you had questions in the beginning. Um, well, great, because from an engagement standpoint, that's what I want for my clients. I want their circle of influence to have more questions and that engagement leads to clients. Same thing for your podcast. So you want them wanting more. So half an hour is a decent amount of time. So that's a good question. Um, yeah, those are kind of the two, three main reasons. And the other is it's short enough for people to consume during lunch or during a commute. Um, and so that's really when, or doing another tour, like the laundry or, or what have you, right? And that's really when people are watching and listening to podcasts is when they're doing something else, um, eating, doing chores, et cetera. And so you want to keep it short and simple. If it's so long, it, it's they're going to lose interest. They're never going to get to the end, and, and you're going to lose that call to action. Speaking of which, I'm not going to go read into this because I don't want to take up that much time. This is basically a summarize a summary of everything I talked about in terms of those seven mo uh, podcast monetization models. This is what you want to do. Some of the things that we didn't talk a lot about is number four of prioritizing your guest list, participating in groups like a Facebook groups, etc participate where your guests would be, where your audience would be. And you want to kind of know that you want to make comments. 
Me meaning, this is not a social media seminar, but I'll say one thing. When it comes to social media, it's more important for you to comment on other people's posts than for you to even be posting your own. And it's an, uh, for me, when I do these kinds of LinkedIn and Facebook seminars for SCORE, I always mention an 80-20 rule where 80% of the stuff is you commenting on other people's posts. It's 20% of your own posts. And if you're posting every day, then you want to be commenting four or five times every day versus on other people's posts. So be active in other people's groups. Be active in the media and the blogs and the content of your guests. That's how you really get into number six, where you're asking other people to share it with others. And if you don't ask, you won't get it. And some people will automatically share without asking. That's great. But you definitely want to mention, hey, can you share this show with others? Do you know one or two other people like you that would be interested in this topic? Ask them, and they'll do that. Uh, that word of mouth is a nice play on words. And then you can start making that list of patrons, sponsors, and, and advertisers, not necessarily to pitch them right away, but to develop the relationship now itself. So they start becoming fans and becoming guests. And then over a period of time, once you can start showing the metrics, to start engaging them as essentially customers, right? Because they are paying you and they want that ROI. Number eight is huge. Um, you know, you want to be on other people's podcasts and potentially you can swap where I'll be your guest, you be my guest, potentially. That doesn't always work out because just because uh, they're a good guest for you doesn't necessarily mean you're a good guest for their topic and their podcast. Sometimes vice versa, you can be a guest on their show very awkward for you to say, I can be a guest on your show, but you can't be a guest on mine because the theme doesn't work out. That can be awkward, but that may be true. And either you create a special episode for them, or maybe they know someone who would be fitting into your theme or topic of your podcast. And maybe that it could be nonetheless a good thing for them because it makes them look good for me to say, hey, I was a, uh, you know, he, I have a guest on my podcast. I'm not a, I'm not a really good fit for his show. Um, but you would be so can, i'm happy to connect you if you want to be interviewed on his podcast and get uh in front of his audience and that's really cool for me to say to someone of, hey i can't be on his podcast because it doesn't really fit but you should be and so can't really swap but there can be a, a definite reciprocity remember this list you can get this of course in the recording so let's go let's talk about kind of the uh instead of the model of how a podcast should be let's talk about the actual technology implementation. Um, from a technology standpoint, it used to be a lot harder than it is nowadays. Uh, used to have to deal with a lot of audio equipment, stuff that I don't really know about. Um, I, you know, I, I see those kinds of long, big, like audio mixing boards. I don't, I don't actually know what all those knobs do. Um, I hear about specs and stuff about DSLRs and HD cams, cameras. I don't know much about like cameras. Uh, I'm not really um, a gadget guy when it comes to audio and video equipment. Uh, luckily, I don't have to be, and you don't need to be either. That world has really changed to how it is nowadays, um, and I'll talk about that. Nowadays, people are much more into live streaming and, and, and really having something that's substantive that it doesn't look like it's amateur hour, but it is nonetheless conversational and casual. Um, and so nowadays, really all you need is a noise canceling microphone. And that microphone sometimes can be attached to your external webcam, but it could be uh, internal. You probably hear me okay. And I have a unidirectional noise canceling microphone built into this laptop. The benefit is it's not gonna pick up any ambient or background noise. So you just really hear me when I'm straight ahead. The negative is that if my kids are around my laptop and we're doing one of those Zoom birthday parties that we did during COVID, well, you know, grandma and grandpa won't really hear my kids because they're here on the side, you know, where my hand is waving. Um, and I'd have to bring them really right in front of this laptop because of the unidirectional, meaning it's this direction only and noise canceling. So you want to look for that. You want to look for a noise canceling microphone. Now you can use a lavalier or a lapel mic. Uh, you can use one of those cool looking microphones that people like to use that makes them look and feel like a podcast host or a talk show host because they have this giant microphone in front of them with one of those fit guards in front of them and they look really professional. You can, but you don't need to. Um, sometimes that can be a little um, obtrusive. You could have headphones on and just hear it through and really feel like uh, 
either you're landing an airplane or hosting a podcast, you can, you don't have to. Nowadays, if you have a, a full HD webcam, which most webcams are, and I'll mention something. Most laptops, their webcams are awful. They're usually not even um, standard HD, let alone full HD. So I'll go into some technical requirements. So I'm sure you know some of this. 1080p is, is full HD. We're getting fast into the world of 4K, even 8K. Um, you probably don't need a 4K or 8K, but if you're going to buy a webcam, it's 4K. Okay, fine. You may as well because you're going to you can use it for the next five to ten years to not worry about it being obsolete. In about ten years, 1080 will be obsolete. Five years, maybe. Um, and in five years, I don't know. Like 4K will definitely be a lot more popular than it is now. When it comes to the internal webcams of laptops, they use a different type of um, 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 nomenclature. They don't really call it 1080p webcams for some reason. It's really I don't know why they make it confusing. You know, we all call it laptops, but all the retailers call it notebooks. You know, it's those kinds of things that really annoy me. Just call it a laptop. Um, in the world of webcams, they don't call it 1080p. They call it five megapixels, five MP. Um, you'll very sometimes you'll see a one MP, a one megapixel, which is 720, uh, which is HD but not full HD. And I'm like, you know what? I want the five megapixel. It's hard to find. Um, sometimes you'll see webcams are 0.5, and I'm like, that's not even HD. Um, so if you're buying a laptop or if you have a laptop, you can look up your specs and see if you have. I mean, you know, are you as crystal clear as I am or not? And if you're not, invest 50 bucks, 100 bucks at most for a 1080p Logitech type of external webcam, pretty easy. Nowadays, it's going into live streaming. That's up to you. Uh, if you feel confident enough to live stream, great. I still feel as much as live streaming is good, people now have to tune in and it becomes an event. That itself has advantages of making it an event and doing a lot of pre-promotion around the event. But I think the convenience of me watching and listening to it whenever I want to is way better. I think that's how podcasts, why podcasts are popular because I can listen to it whenever I want. Something for you to consider. In terms of scheduling, I use Calendly. There are dozens of scheduling systems out there that are like Calendly. I suggest you use a, an appointment scheduling system like that for your guests because you will find very quickly scheduling time between all your guests is going to be a real pain in the neck. Pick a day and time for your podcast. Friday's at noon or some other time that you know you're going to stick to and offer that time for your guests and offer it through Calendly and have them pick the week that they are available. My running joke is that you've got podcasts, funerals, and weddings. People will make the time to show up to your podcast, much like a funeral and a wedding. Maybe those are a little bit more important, but nonetheless, they will find the time to come onto your podcast. They may not do it literally this Friday at noon, maybe not next Friday at noon, but two, three weeks from now, they're available. Now, there will be exceptions to the rule. Some people will have a standing meeting where they're always busy Fridays at noon and they're never available Fridays at noon. All right, you can make that exception uh, if you want to. But you know 90% of the people will be able to fit it into their schedule given two to three weeks advance notice. Schedule it out. I like scheduling guests out two to three months in advance. It also gives me the opportunity, if I wanted to, to do some pre-promotion. I'm working on automation around the pre-promotion of going, hey, I'm scheduling out guests eight to 10 weeks in advance. That's 10 weeks of potential promotion time that we could be doing to really get the best engaged audience for me and for my guest. I'm working on software around that automation. I'm not really announcing anything right now, but if that is interesting, you know, I'm happy for you to kind of test it out with me. But definitely use something like Calendly to schedule it out. Um, then you have the world of Anchor, Libsyn, Spreaker. What does that mean? Well, let me show you what that means with this diagram. So, you know, we did all the fun part of monetization and how to make money. This is all the technical mumbo jumbo, so you got to bear with me. So this is what a podcast really is. Uh, these are all the, the, let me explain this diagram. In the middle, that Pentagon house looking thing is where your podcast is actually going to live in that little house. Um, and so, for example, um, Anchor, now known, uh, has um, about a year ago, or maybe two years, got bought by Spotify. So Anchor got renamed as Spotify for podcasts. Um, prior to Anchor being kind of number one because of Spotify, you have a system called Libsyn, if you see in the bottom right, Libsyn. And Libsyn and Anchor are probably the two biggest podcast hosts. 
Meaning when you record the podcast as an audio MP3 file or a video MP4 file, that peach circle on the left-hand side, well, you could use Zoom, StreamYard, you could use whatever you want to record. That kind of doesn't matter. You're taking that recording and uploading that physical file to a host, the server, the computer in the sky, which is actually a computer in you know, some fortified basement someplace. And that's the cloud, right? That's the server. That's the host where the podcast really lives. That podcast host, be it Anchor, Libsyn, et cetera, will generate something called an RSS. RSS feed or an RSS, which stands for really simple syndication. RSS, that file, um, comes from the days of blogs. Blogs have uh, RSS feeds and things like that. They use the same standard. That RSS is what is being used by the apps that your audience is using on their phones or computer, but usually phones, right? So your Apple podcast, your Spotify app, your Google podcast app is all using the RSS file that is being given to them by the host. You don't have to worry about any of that. All you need to focus on is signing up for a host account. I like Anchor, which is now um, podcast by Spotify. It's free, and I like that because it's free. Libsyn is about 30 bucks a month. Is there any reason to use Libsyn over Anchor? No. Anchor, which is now Spotify, also supports video podcasts, which, quite frankly, if you're going to do a video podcast, just do it on YouTube. But you also want people to be able to listen to it through their podcast app. All podcast apps support RSS. Another analogy to think of, you've got the warehouse of the host sending out the little yellow trucks to the retail stores. The RSS is automatically generated by the server, by the host, so you don't have to worry about that. All you do is you need to open up an account with Apple, with Spotify, Google Podcasts, et cetera. Those, you know, between those three and, of course, YouTube, those four, you're going to be covered. Um, once you create the accounts there, you're then going to put in that, that username and password information into Anchor, which is Spotify Podcasts. Once you make that connection, that bridge, that's there. Once the bridge is built between the host and the retailers, they'll send the little yellow trucks themselves. That's what you're paying them or ostensibly paying. And while you're not literally paying for Anchor, you will eventually, because your podcast will be very popular and, and Spotify will want to run ads during your podcast. Um, so um, they may or may not share a lot of revenue with you, but quite frankly, you're getting their hosting for free and that's how they make money ads. They probably won't put ads onto your podcast until it becomes very popular. What does popular mean? Well, on a monthly basis, probably well over 5,000 downloads every month. Um, a download is, a, is very similar to a subscriber. Subscriber means they will automatically download, and a download is just a manual download. Very similar to a listen or a view. So those are all interchangeable words. Uh, you have views uh, and listens um, and, and subscribers. I can go into that nomenclature a little bit later, but that's the focus. Now, you have a whole other arrow on the bottom, which is the social media channels. So while you are uploading the MP4 or the MP3, MP3 is audio, MP4 is video, you're uploading that to the host. You're also doing the same thing to YouTube or to Instagram and to um uh, LinkedIn and to Facebook, and whether or not you want to do it on Twitter X is up to you. I have to update the logo for this kind of presentation. And so you are uploading the full file also to YouTube. Now, you can also upload the full file to the other social media platforms, or you can use a YouTube link. That's from um, kind of a social media strategy perspective, which I won't get into, but you have that choice. So you have those two arrows. Your focus, record the podcast. Uh, that's the simplest thing. And then you have opening up the account. It's a one-time setup thing. It's a pain in the neck to do. It takes about you know a couple of hours to do. Um, if you want me to walk you through it more one-on-one, -on -one, I'm happy to do it, but it's really easy. Go to Apple Podcasts and you can literally go to Google, start a new podcast on Spotify. You'll get the link. Um, it's really easy. Start a new podcast on Google Podcasts. Start a new podcast on Apple Podcasts. You'll get the link, open up an account. They're all free. Put the account into, uh, into Spotify's anchor. You're fine. It's really easy. But this gives you kind of the diagram to kind of know that you've checked off everything. And then what should you name your show? This is kind of a fun thing. I like your name of your show to be relevant and resonant to your business. 
So if you've got a slogan or a motto um, to your company, to your business, well, there might be some kind of poetic aspect to it that you can lift as your show name. You want to keep it short and simple. If there's an analogy or metaphor that you use with your customers and clients, there might be some word there. Another way of thinking about your show name is kind of from two aspects. What do your guests want to be associated with? And what do your audience, your types of customers aspire to achieve? So the association concept is, well, you want your guests to be proud to share their episode to their circle of influence. So they want to be associated with this show just by name alone, let alone what they talked about with you. And then think about the team as what's the goal? What, what do you help your clients achieve or overcome? Well, their number one problem, their number one challenge or number one desire or goal is really what they're going to learn and be inspired to take action on because of your podcast. So you can think about that. And I'll show you some examples with uh, my actual clients in a moment. I would say avoid your personal brand. Like the, you know, while celebrities will brand their show after their name, well, their name has a pull already. If your name doesn't have a pull already, even in your, in your circle of influence, then yes, you should include your name as a host, but it's not going to be, it's not going to be the, the Diane Murphy show, for example. It's going to be with the host, Diane Murphy. You want to keep it short and simple. Um, very similar to the way business books are, where you have kind of a two or three word title of the book, and then you have a longer description. And that longer description is what I have on the right-hand side. That longer description shouldn't really be a, a pithy, catchy, clever tagline. Uh, it should really be conversational, natural language where people really do understand what am I going to get from watching or listening to your show. Use the keywords and the jargon that your type of audience would resonate with. What do they want to know? What is your why? What are you doing this for? Which is very often to help your types of clients and audience. And so the ABC questions I also include for my clients where you want to talk about who are the kinds of guests that would be there? What's qualified for them to be a guest? Why should people watch and listen to your show? What are the some type of questions that you'll be asking? You might end up with a, a, a structure where you have a standard opening question, a standard closing question, maybe a standard one or two substantive in the middle questions. That script or structure to your show will also help people understand what your show is about. Once you have those kind of three elements, your show name, the tagline, and the structure, then you kind of got the basis of everything you need, especially to open up these Apple Podcasts, Spotify, because they're going to want to know the name of your podcast. They're going to want to know the description, and you can copy and paste it in. Really easy. Now, every episode, though, should also have three things. So there are three things that I, I could kind of rearrange and say, what are the three things for the show? You want the show name, the description, um, as, as well as the structure, the script, right? And then the three things you want for every episode is a title, the description of each episode. And the third thing that I didn't really include here that I should is a thumbnail. We include a thumbnail. YouTube, I'm sure you're familiar. If you go to YouTube, um, when you're scrolling, you'll see static images, right? Still images that you're kind of, there's a billboard or a little postcard about that video. And then if you hover over it, it'll start automatically playing on mute. Same kind of thing. You want to create a thumbnail for every episode. Uh, whether or not you include it in the podcast platforms is up to you, but you definitely want to think about the title of every episode. From a search engine perspective, not only Google being a search engine, but Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube itself are search engines. People are searching for topics, and you want to include that topic in the title of the episode. You will also want to include your guest name, and you also want to include your name because you want to go along for the ride, but your guest name and the title, which is the topic, is way more important. 150 characters. You can really go to Google and find one of those character uh, counting, charactercounter.com, uh, pardon, charactercounter.net is one of them, where you could put it in and know that you're less than 150 characters. Um, whether or not you include the episode number in the title is up to you. You'll see that. Um, I can go either way on it. It's really not important. Uh, it's helpful if you're going to be able to say episode 37, you can go and listen to that topic, possibly you're probably not going to remember. And it's not that relevant because it's a topic that is much more keyword oriented that people are going to be searching for and that you yourself are going to need to remember to reference what is episode 37. The other reason I don't like episode numbers is that once you create a catalog, a library of topics, 
well, you can republish, re-release episodes at a later time. So episode 13 might end up being episode 37, which might also end up being 108. So that's really confusing. Um, but if it's a topic, now you can just reference the topic and they can just search the topic and they'll come up. And the fact that you released it November 2023, but also April 24, as well as, let's say, you know, December of 2025 is kind of irrelevant. Um, it's the topic that they want. It's, it's the information that they want. Um, and, and it's the guests that are proud to have the episode released. And then you have the description. Also known as show notes. So show notes are basically a summary of everything you talked about on the show. Now, I actually call it summary notes because I want the full show notes, which is the full transcript of the episode as a blog post on the website. So the summary notes is gonna have a link to the full transcription as a blog post on the website, but you want the show notes to reference that, but also have your contact information, your guest's contact information, the two or three questions that you guys talked about um, during, um, during it. So this way, the questions that you guys discussed, you and your guests discussed, will also appear in the search results. We have the title, as well as the description, thumbnail being the third thing. This is um, a couple of logos, uh, show logos. And this is what you want to think about. It's going to be small. It's going to be small on a cell phone. It's going to be small even on a laptop screen. So when you're designing it, you want at minimum 1,000 by 1,000 square. Podcast logos are always square. Uh, so you can kind of see examples here where Sometimes I'll, I'll include small text, but the small text is going to be the description, which is quite frankly already written on the actual screen anyway. So it's not like I'm relying on the imagery to, to learn about that. I like using uh, um, photos of the host. Um, I think um, you should have your photo of you so people can immediately recognize you and see you. It's from a personal branding standpoint. But sometimes uh, people have a face for radio or a face for audio podcasts and they don't want their face on their show logo. That's fine. That's up to my client. But I think everyone looks good and should have the presence on their show logo. Um, I like um, doing it right on Canva. So if you know what Canva is, really easy graphic, uh, graphic editor. Um, and so I created all of these on, on Canva and we have maybe double, triple of these logos that I can update. Uh, but it gives you kind of a, a quick look of how it should be square tagline if you need it. If you don't, um, you don't always need to include the tagline. Um, sometimes I, um, I'll include it, if, A, if there's space, and B, if the name itself isn't very uh, descriptive. <laughs> and we're hopefully not running out of time, but we may be running out of time, so I want to wrap it up. I'll, I'll leave you guys here, uh, and I want to answer some questions, Diane. But this is where to find guests. And you can kind of use this as a resource and use this um, when you get the slides. And there are a couple of other things that I'll, I've included as bonus material, which is the checklist that I referred to. But a lot of this we have already covered. Diane, in the remaining minutes, is there a question that I didn't get to? Well, we had a question <laughs> early on about uh, I often see podcasts where people are watching a small computer screen and commenting yeah. on it. Reaction videos. Um, yeah, it's not really necessarily a podcast thing. It's more of a YouTube thing. Uh, and you could do that using uh, a thing like StreamYard. You can have it as, uh, but they use more sophisticated equipment where they're streaming or they're showing a YouTube video and they're doing a reaction video on it or they're doing a response. Or, and you can use StreamYard for that and you can use other software for that where it's picture in picture. It's basically the concept you're looking for. Relatively uh -huh. easy to do. I, I have a 10 month old nonprofit podcast with 12 episodes. I need to expand into social media, Facebook uh, for its impact into seniors, my target audience. Is there a way to affordably promote my series? Yeah, I would, I would highly recommend, um, first of all, going as an interview show because the number one way of you promoting the show will be through your guests. And then your guests will turn, uh, will, will create more of a fan base. The fan base you should collect as a Facebook group. And now you have a way for your fan base and Facebook group to now grow. And so fans, audience can now bring other people into the Facebook group who become other and new fans, especially if it's a nonprofit, it's very mission oriented. So you want to find other people very similar to how you're growing the nonprofit 
it's very similar how you're growing the show itself, where they're going to be people who are um, aligned with and allied with that mission of uh, the pod, uh, of the nonprofit. Same thing with the mission of the podcast. So focus on the Venn diagram of your guests as well as your fans. Facebook group it so you can start developing that community, and then um, you know then it's up to you whether or not you want to go into the other circle of advertising. Uh, but to say that that's affordable, you know, it kind of depends. Um, I would highly recommend that the episode also have that kind of a call to action. Is there a place where people can now donate to the nonprofit slash podcast to keep it going? And what do they get for it? Uh, is it towards the capital raise campaign? Is it towards specific ben beneficiaries, towards the charitable uh, mission work that you're doing through the nonprofit? Or is there other type of exclusive content that they can get because of podcast? Uh, it's something that we could definitely discuss offline. Okay, uh, I want to start a podcast about aging. How hmm. can I talk about things such as medical and not get sued? For example, someone had hip replacement surgery and they talk about their experience or someone who takes vitamin C and they feel so much more energetic. Do I put a disclaimer and how do I protect myself legally? Yeah, 100%. You want a disclaimer before, during, and after. So you want a disclaimer um, before the show and after the show. I'm not an attorney, so I don't want to speak out of turn. Um, but I can connect you with attorneys that can speak to that in terms of um, providing any kind of health information because you're not providing advice, right? You, know, you are providing information that they should check with their health professional. Um, I'm sure you can find standard disclaimers. You could also check with an attorney to find a more specific disclaimer, but absolutely. Um, you want to basically have that as a disclaimer and make sure that people are checking with their health professional and not just taking the uh, information as um, specific advice. Uh, my clients, uh, as attorneys, they also have their own um, um, aspects that they have to be careful of uh, to not only disclaim, but to make sure that people aren't taking what they're saying as advice, um, even more so in your case, because you know people can get themselves in financial and other type of legal trouble taking the wrong legal advice. But here, this is even more health related. And so they can really hurt themselves or hurt others or get into a really bad situation. So even more so, you want to be careful. And of course, have your guests be careful as well um, and, and make sure that the, your guests are able to kind of disclaim as much as they may be health professionals themselves, that they're not working one-on-one -on -one with anyone in the audience. And so they they, they should know that either they, that should be discussed one-on-one, -on -one, like I'm offering it here, um, or they provide their own disclaimer. It's a great question. Okay. I think a lot of these questions have actually been answered, but... Uh, let's start with this one. Um, I'm starting a podcast, starting with low, no budget. What do you recommend for capturing video, Zoom, or some other software? And I think- Yeah, we're talking about that, right? Streaming art is what I right? suggest. That, that right. would be tremendous. Right, right. I think it's a lot of software, hardware, yeah. um, uh, tools um, very new and, to and, this. And yeah, you, you'll see a lot of things I, I mentioned here yeah. uh, on this slide, so you can get that. Um and then some of the things are more bonus stuff, but I'm happy to chat with anyone one on one. So definitely, yeah. Uh, I, I reiterating, yes, you will get the video. Yes, we you will get the slides. Uh, that should happen uh, later today or tomorrow. Uh, my product is a small marketing tool, an eyewear product. Uh, would a podcast lend itself here at all? How to advertise to reach potential clients with a podcast from a Get go, please. Is it legal slash allowed to blitz it via email if it is emailable to clients or do you need permission? Possibly stupid questions, but if no, you do no, not no, ask, you do Yeah, not you want to start with an email list that's permission based. So you want to definitely email everyone in the first place and say, hey, starting a podcast, I'd love for you to be on the email list when I drop a new episode. Um, let me know if you uh, don't want to be on this email list and you can make it opt out or opt in. Or click here to be part of the, you know, um, part of the audience uh, of my new podcast. And so you can have an opt in. But you definitely, one way or another, need that permission at, or people get really upset that you're just spamming them. So you don't want to come out of nowhere and start spamming them, but you do want to give them a heads up, opt in and or opt out. Um, that's one aspect. Um, I think any anytime you're talking about a, an expertise, it can be turned into a podcast between you. And I would highly recommend, again, bringing in other experts, other people who you rely on as client resources, uh, peer resources, as well as referral relationships, and start having a discussion where it's less about pitching the product, but talking about the 
problems that your types of clients and customers go through and the types of solutions that they can seek out. Uh, now, your product as either, um, forget if it's, if it's like eyewear or if it's like- I, I, I wear something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or a software product. Either way, you are part of the solution. And so uh, you are means to an end. And so from that aspect, what is the end in mind? What is their goal? What is their frustration? What are they trying to achieve? And that's, those are the topics. Uh, of your podcast that you're going to go and and you may not be able to solve every aspect relate that's either direct or tangential to what they're going through that's where your um ecosystem of referral relationships come into play um and that's why you're bringing in these other resources because you know as much as you're an expert in what you do there are other aspects that you're not an expert in but you can nonetheless provide a platform of resource and vice versa, right? They, they're they bringing, your guests are bringing you into their world. So I think absolutely it can be uh, expert driven, but it's, think of it, it's not as a commercial for your product. It's an education around the frustrations and goals of your clients. Last question, and I think it's kind of an interesting one. Should your business be an LLC for your podcast to avoid liability? Um. Your, your podcast can be uh, a service of your business, uh, but I, I don't want to speak out of turn. I'm not a business attorney, though I do work with them. So if you uh, want that connection, or I'm sure Diane can connect you with others. Um, so yeah, you don't necessarily create, you don't have to create an LLC or a business entity for your podcast, at least not right away. Um, as your podcast itself becomes a revenue generator directly with those monetization models, that's something you want to talk to a business lawyer about. But in the beginning where it's a, it's a, basically a content marketing channel for your business it's a it's very similar to your website or to your blog it's a it's an extension of your business okay last uh, last pitch for a mentor if you have business issues questions problems please consider applying for a mentor go to score.org minnesota you'll fill it in a little questionnaire and you'll be assigned a mentor and lastly, we want to thank our presenter, uh, Vikram. You did a great job. Um, so much information. Yes, yes, yes. You will be getting a copy of this. If I say that one more time, uh, you will be getting the slides. Uh, so you'll be able to zip right through and see all the lists that are on them. You will also will be getting a survey from our national organization. If you could take a moment to fill that in and evaluate our presentation. And also uh, let me know what other topics are you interested in? Uh, as Vikram said, we, we like to schedule out, uh, I've got you scheduled uh, through the end of April right now. Uh, so, um, you know, if there are other topics that you'd like to see after that, let me know. I'm always looking for ideas. So, Thank you to our uh, participants. Thank you for coming. I hope that you felt this was a, a valuable use of your time. Thank you, Vikram, for sharing your expertise. You were amazing. All right. Uh, I think that's it. And uh, we'll see you hopefully next week. We do this weekly. So look in your email for what's coming up next. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.